collisions are all around us every single moment even right now millions of collisions are happening all around between the molecules of air now the problem with collisions of that size is that we can't even see them but for a moment if you were able to actually even see those collisions it wouldn't help much because now we can see them but we still can't see what's happening during the collision because it's happening too fast if you pick one of these collisions ran at random then the collision would last for such a small amount of time that you'll have no idea what's happening during the collision so what you would see is just this but you must have a question when you saw that right yeah two bodies came looked like something happened between them and then they went back now let's imagine that they came at some velocity v v1 and v2 so they had some kinetic energies right half m v1 squared half m v2 squared depending on their masses so m1 and m2 if you want to then The question you must have, given that you've come from the background of energy just now, is what's happening in the energy in this case? Because there's some kinetic energy, total sum, and if you imagine them colliding, there must have been a point while they were colliding when their kinetic energy was zero, because both of them have must have stopped before going to the other side. So there was a point when both of them were at rest. Then what will happen to that kinetic energy when they were colliding? Now to understand what's happening during the collision we might really have to turn time down to really get a chance to watch what's happening when the bodies are colliding and not before or after the collision and you observe something mind blowing when they are colliding the balls are not spheres anymore they are deformed which means that now you know what happened to all that kinetic energy The assumption that we had made was everything was rigid. That's how we were solving all our problems. But here we see that these two balls that collided had to be deformed for a while, and therefore convert the kinetic energy into the elastic potential energy of themselves, right? The body's deformation, and then go back with their original kinetic energies. Which means every collision does involve some amount of deformation, as far as we're dealing with large-scale macroscopic bodies. Then. you will say then i can't solve any problems in collision because i don't know how to deal with deformable bodies i have been dealing with rigid bodies ever since so what do i do now the question then is can we still maintain our visualization of a collision without bringing in these deformable bodies that i'm so unfamiliar with i want to keep my rigid bodies that i've dealt with for so long and still think about collisions how can i do that maybe we can outsource the deforming part of the collision to a spring between those two bodies so if you have two bodies now and instead of them deforming they outsource that job like most boring jobs in the developed world are outsourced to the developing countries that job to a spring and the spring now does the job of deforming for them so they can continue to be rigid and not do things they don't like to do so then the picture becomes two rigid bodies colliding with a spring between them and this is a much simpler take on collisions than what we saw above To do this, let's first understand what deformation really is. When a body or two bodies are getting deformed, energy is being stored as that elastic potential energy. Right? Then, can I bring here somebody who I already know knows how to store elastic potential energy? Who is it? A spring. So, can I take this unfamiliar thing called a deformable body and replace it with two familiar things, two rigid bodies and a spring between them? Now, this is a simple way to look at collisions, right? Now we're going to begin with a simple case of one-dimensional collision where both the bodies are going along the same direction. And you know from what you've learned till now in physics, that the most complex things are learned by reducing them to, them to their simplest case and then building on from that. You learn projectile motion by learning to deal with a ball being thrown up and a ball being rolled. Two one-dimensional motions of particles. Today we're already in a stage where we're talking about collisions between particles. So you're going to watch now as we start with a simple case and slowly build on to complex cases of collisions. The simplest case is two balls going in the same direction along a straight line. Let one of the bodies have a mass m one, the other one have a mass m two. The velocity of this is v one. The velocity of that is v two. Now this same scenario is going to be represented as a rigid block of mass m one with velocity v one, a rigid block of mass m two with velocity v two, except that that block has a spring attached to it behind. Now, if v two is greater than v one, we can all go home. It because these two bodies will never meet. Even if v two equals v one, we can all go because they'll be moving together all the time. But it becomes interesting only when v one is greater than v two, which means that at some point in time, let's call it t one, they will 
begin colliding. Yeah, and what that means for us is this body will go just begin to touch body M2. And for us on top, that is that body beginning to touch the spring that's attached behind body M2. So that's how it'll look. Now the beauty to observe over here is that the moment body M1 has made contact with the spring's left end, these two are in contact, which means they're constrained to move with the same velocity. And this is true for the right end and the body M2 as well, because they, those two are in contact, then they have to move with the same velocity. And you know, V1 is greater than V2, which means the left end of the spring is moving faster than the right end. In other words, the spring is going to feel a compression, which means the spring is going to push back. So what, what it's going to do, is going to push M1 behind and push M2 forward. In other words, M1 is going to feel a deceleration, its speed is going to reduce and M2 speed is going to increase. In other words, V2 is going to increase. Now this is going to continue for a bit until both these reach the same velocity. Because V1 was larger and reducing and V2 was smaller and increasing, there will be a point when they both reach the same velocity. And at that point, it's a crucial point in time because we can freeze time there and notice that the spring has reached its maximum compression. Because uh, right now, both the ends of the spring are moving at the same velocity. The spring is not going to feel any more compression, so it's not going to get compressed anymore. But now, both these bodies in the same velocity, the spring is going to start continuing to apply an expanding force on them, which means that body M1 is going to still feel a deceleration. Its speed is going to further reduce, so V1 is going to go below V2, and V2 is going to start increasing because the spring is pushing it, continuing to push it forward. So this will continue. So V1 begins by being greater than V2, ends up becoming equal to V2 when the spring has reached its maximum compression. And now, when we let this continue, spring expands even more, and V1 reduces even more, and V2 increases even more, till the spring reaches its natural length. After which it doesn't do any pushing, and V1 loses contact with the spring's left end. And then the body, along attached to M2, continues to go away. Now, in summary, the points in time where the body M1 hadn't yet made contact with the spring's left end are what we call before the collision. And the time duration during which the body M1 and the spring, left end of the spring, are in contact, which involves the compression and the expansion, till the point just before the spring loses contact with the body M1 are what we call during the collision. And the point the left end of the spring loses contact with the body M1 and leaves that point in time to anything later than that is what we call after the collision. Now first let's take a look at momentum before, during and after the collision. But the first thing I want you to observe is if you look at this as a system and given that you only care about the horizontal, see something can be happening along the vertical, there is gravity acting, there is a normal reaction, it doesn't matter. Only along the horizontal there is no friction, which means if you consider these two bodies and the spring including, that this entire thing is a system then there is no external force at all. And you know that F external equals delta P by delta D. If F external is zero, then delta P has to be zero no matter what. It just has to be zero. Then, before the collision, during the collision, and after the collision, the momentum has no other choice than to remain a constant. Otherwise, it violates Newton's second law. And we will not allow that to happen. Right? So, if there's one thing that's conserved before, during, and after its momentum, it's fundamental to a collision, the law of conservation of momentum. But now let's ask, what about energy? Now, the bodies begin by having some kinetic energies, right? So, half m1v1 squared plus half m2v2 squared. But, while they are colliding, what's happening? You can see that the spring is compressing, which means, from your knowledge of energy, there is some elastic potential energy of that spring. But now let's observe that this system is isolated as well, right? If you draw a box around the system, there is no external force. There is no work being done from outside. Which means the energy of the system, the mechanical energy, needs to be conserved. Yes? If at all, if there was friction, even more only will be lost. So nothing can be added to this. So clearly, the sum of the kinetic energy and the elastic potential energy is a constant. There isn't any other change. It's not on an inclined plane or something where gravity will come into the picture. Nothing at all. So it's only between these two. The account transfers are between kinetic energy of the two balls and the elastic potential energy of the spring between them. Then, if we know for sure, which we do, that the elastic potential energy increased because initially it was zero, the spring was at its natural length, then that account transfer must have happened from kinetic energy. There's just no other way around it. Which means during the collision, the kinetic energy had to reduce because the elastic potential energy increased and we know that.
Of course, after the collision, the kinetic energy can come back to its original value. The account can be completely transferred back to kinetic energy from elastic potential energy. But during collision, it has to reduce. Which means the kinetic energy is conserved before and after if the spring comes back to its natural length after the collision. But no matter what, during the collision, the kinetic energy is lower than its value in the beginning. So the kinetic energy is not conserved before, during and after. It is momentum that is conserved. To add a layer to what you have already understood, in the example that we did take, we assume that once you compress the spring, it, when it expands, it expands back to its original natural length. So it's a very trustworthy spring. If you give it some elastic potential energy, it will come back till it's given it all back in the form of kinetic energy. So such a trustworthy spring is also called a purely elastic spring. Now the word elastic means your tendency to regain your original shape once you've been deformed. So for a body that's colliding, that's the meaning for it. In a spring, it's trivially the tendency of the spring to come back to its original natural length. Now that's perfect. If it, you take it and make it something and it comes back to it exactly, it's called a purely elastic spring. And such a collision that involves a purely elastic spring is called a perfectly elastic or a purely elastic collision. Now in this case, the kinetic energy before and the kinetic energy after will be equal. So whatever energy was credited, the spring's account as elastic potential energy is given back to the body's as kinetic energy completely. Then it's a purely elastic collision. Now of course, in any case, we know momentum is conserved, so it's always conserved. In the case of a purely elastic collision, before and after, kinetic energy is also conserved. Of course, not during, we just told you that. But if the spring is not so trustworthy, the spring is a cheat, then once you invest all your kinetic energy in that spring, it takes it all as much as it can in, in the form of elastic potential energy till the two bodies are the same velocity, right? Now we saw that the spring has the maximum compression when both the bodies are the same velocity. So that's the point where it can accept as much as it can. And then if it refuses to give away anything at all, it holds on to that. It has no tendency to regain its original length. It's purely inelastic. Then what will happen? These two bodies will continue to go on, stuck to each other for forever. They'll, they'll have the same velocities all the time. So in this case, the kinetic energy is not conserved. The kinetic energy finally will be lesser than the kinetic energy before because it was lost in the form of plastic potential energy. But the two bodies will continue with the same velocity, which means you can treat them almost like a single body after that. Now, in many cases, the spring is neither a completely trustworthy person nor a cheat. Yeah, it's a realistic spring which takes in a little, yeah, gives back a part of what it took. So, in that case, where you compress the spring and it reaches its maximum compression, and it does come back, it does want to try and come back to its original length. It is elastic, but not purely elastic. It comes back a little bit and stops. So if you start at some L and push it, it will come back to some length, but which is lesser than L. Then what will happen? This is called a partially inelastic collision, where the initial kinetic energy is larger than the final kinetic energy, but the two bodies are separated after the collision. They do have different velocities. And in all these three cases, observe that before, during, and after the momentum is conserved, but only in the purely elastic case is the kinetic energy conserved before and after. So now you have a picture very clearly of what a purely elastic, a purely inelastic, and a partially inelastic collision look like.